There we are, off we go. So we are very, very fortunate to have this exhibition. It was designed for the Queen's Galleries and it opened at the Queen's Gallery in Edinburgh, which is attached to the Palace of Holyrood House. It opened there uh, on a very snowy day last winter and it ran over the Christmas period. And then it's going to go on from here to the Queen's Gallery at Buckingham Palace and that will run through uh, from, from um, next spring, so it'll run over the summer at Buckingham Palace. So we're very, very privileged to have the exhibition here. Everything in this exhibition comes from the Royal Collection. It's all been collected by different members of the Royal Family since Rowlandson's own time. I should say a little bit for those of you who, who don't know, because you may get awkward questions about this, so I'll explain a little bit about the Royal Collection Trust. It's a private trust, and it was set up to own the Royal Collection. The Royal Collection is all of the stuff from extremely important things like the Rembrandt's mother picture that we had last year to things like um, uh, presents that are given to royal visitors. Um, and they're all kept in the various public residences around the country, from Buckingham Palace to Balmoral and Sandringham. On the one hand, the Royal Collection doesn't receive public funding, but on the other hand, the collection doesn't belong to the Queen, so it's an independent trust. And the trust is trying to open up its collections to make them more accessible to the public. And one way that they can do that is to lend more to museums. And we've really, really benefited from that. Not only um, through the Rembrandt exhibition last year, but also with this Rowlandson. And then next year, we're very excited because we're going to get the Royal Gold exhibition next autumn. And that's going to be really exciting. I'm... Now, all of these prints and drawings come from the Royal Library at Windsor. That's where they're kept, in the, in the library there, um, mostly nowadays in albums. And they've been collected over the generations, starting with George III. And one of the most important collectors of Rowlandson's work was this man. This is a young Prince of Wales, later George IV. We know that he actually purchased this print from Rowlandson, even though it's a satire against himself. Here he is borrowing money from these two very politically incorrect looking money lenders. And uh, he was always in debt. He borrowed a lot of money um, because he loved beautiful things and he also loved gambling. Um, but we're now benefiting from some of his extravagant buying because he did buy some of Rowlandson's best work. It's still in the Royal Collection and now it's here upstairs. There are over a thousand Rowlandsons in the Royal Collection. So what you're seeing here is just a tiny fraction. Very few of them have ever been hung on the walls. So they're in excellent condition and their colours are still astonishingly bright. So this is what the exhibition looked like when it was on in Edinburgh. As you can see, the Queen's Gallery there is a very, very different sort of environment from our gallery here. Very different colours, very different spaces. And what we had to do was to cut it down. There are getting on for 100 items in the original exhibition. We had to take that down to nearer 60, because then after that, what we did is we added some more back on. So we took out the Scottish things because we didn't think they were particularly funny. They were designed to appeal to Scottish visitors and you know to talk to the, the referendum and so on. Um, and we've replaced them with some satires about Bath. So you won't find those in the catalogue because they're later editions, but they are on the audio guide. We've rewritten the audio script so that they can be included. 
So we've now got 84 works in the exhibition. What I'm now going to do, and I'll try and keep it as brief as possible so that you can spend lots of time in the exhibition itself, I'm going to give you a short biography of Rowlandson himself, and then I'll take you on a virtual tour of the exhibition and talk you through a few practicalities, which Spencer will then go into more detail on. Here he is, Thomas Rowlandson. He often makes drawings and satires of himself. Sometimes he makes himself look very elegant, as here. Sometimes he makes himself look completely hideous. We know that he enjoyed laughing at his, him, his own self as much as other people. So he was born in London a generation after Thomas Gainsborough, 1757. Like Gainsborough, he came from a business family. His father was a merchant in the city. But like many merchants at the time, he went bankrupt at a time when Thomas was only little. He was only two years old. And he and his sister were sent to live with a rich uncle. This uncle was a silk weaver in Spitalfield, and he was married to a Huguenot lady. And between the two of them, they had quite a lot of money. They were able to bring up Thomas. They sent him to school in Soho. And then when he was 15, they sent him to the Royal Academy schools. And he did very well there, although already he was gaining a reputation as a bit of a clown. So there's an anecdote about him in a life drawing class with a female model. And he came into the life drawing class with a pea shooter so that he could shoot peas at the young lady and make her leap about. He um, also went to Paris. He studied in Paris thanks to his aunt, who, as I said, was French. She was a Huguenot. And uh, he studied there, we're pretty sure, with a sculptor called Jean-Baptiste Pigalle, so he always had an interest in sculpture. But what he really made his name with was satires and funnies. And this is one of the very earliest ones, 1776, it's a pen and ink drawing. A bench of artists, um, sketches at the Royal Academy. So he is supposed to be drawing the model in the, in the life drawing class, but he's actually drawing the people sitting opposite him, all scribbling away. So these are caricatures of, uh, we don't know which artists, but uh, they are his fellow students and artists at the Academy. He won a silver medal. He was awarded it by the Academy in 1777. So it shows you that he was very highly regarded as a draftsman, and also at the time as... Um, a budding sculptor. His early work was very much influenced by John Hamilton Mortimer, who was also a very funny person. Um, he was eccentric as an individual, he was eccentric as an artist. He was also very influential because he was a fun person to be with. He was always at the centre of sociable activity in the art world. But what we show you in the exhibition is the way that Mortimer influenced Rowlandson's drawing style. So this is a very early drawing by Rowlandson, the School of Eloquence, pen and ink drawing. And um, you'll see, as in the previous drawing, um, you see how he, he does all this zigzag hatching. And then another thing which is very typical of Rowlandson is that he uses little dots um, to outline the contours of people's faces. So you'll often see very dotty looking faces. And what that is, is just to give the face some shape. It's not showing you that somebody is freckled or pockmarked or anything. It's just this particular technique of giving some shape to a face. Here's Mortimer, <clears throat> again, using some similar tricks. This drawing is upstairs. And um, I apologise for this horrible slide. You'll see it much better upstairs. The other great influence on Rowlandson 
is William Hogarth, who is a couple of generations earlier. Those of you who are very familiar with Hogarth's work, his paintings and his prints, may well see the influences in here. Um, this character, this lady who's been having a bit too much fun, um, she's very Hogarthian, although in Hogarth it's, it's not a lady, it's, it's a man who's throwing up into somebody's hat. Um, over on the left, this sprawling character here is taken straight from the Rake's Progress. There is Tom Rakewell um, in more or less the same sort of posture. Um, Rowlandson did collect Hogarth prints. Like Hogarth, he wasn't interested in the grand manner. He was interested in drawing, printmaking, at the more popular end of the art market. And he first starts working with printmakers around this time, uh, about 1780. This is one of his first published prints, Italian affectation, real characters. These are um, a real opera singer and dancer. A lot of English people at the time were a bit resentful that the stage was still dominated by Italians. So this is sort of trying to put people off. I should, of course, say that um, if we get any visitors who worship at the Temple of Political Correctness, I think they might be a bit upset by this exhibition. Um, but I hope that most people who come will have a good sense of humour. So I thought I should spend a bit of time explaining the print market because it, it is complicated and it can be confusing. The works in the exhibition have been presented as the work of Thomas Rowlandson. The drawings, of course, are all his own work, but with the prints, um, sometimes he will have designed the prints and somebody else will then have etched them. They're almost all etchings. Somebody else etches them and then somebody again will print them. Somebody again will colour them in using a guide produced by the artist himself. So, as here, this is actually by Gilray, this one. But these colours are added on a sort of painting by numbers process um, by professional colour inners, colourers, um, who of course get paid very, very little for doing it. And then, of course, there's the publisher, there's the print seller. And this is the shop of one of uh, uh, Rowlandson's many associates. This is the shop of Hannah Humphrey in St. James's Street. Hannah Humphrey was very closely associated with James Gilray. And this one, as, as I said, is by Gilray. But what's interesting here is that you see how the prints were arranged in the shop window and how important they were as a way of, um, of passing information around. They were a very, very important medium, um, particularly for people who couldn't read, uh, like perhaps this young urchin here. You see the variety of people who were crowded round, looking to see what's going on in the world, um, who is famous, what they're famous for, who's been up to something silly, and uh, it's a very good way of keeping people informed and also of just entertaining them and making them laugh. So, as I said, Rowlandson has designed some of the prints and they've been etched by other people, but also vice versa. Some of the prints are designed by other people and etched by Rowlandson. So that's why they, there's quite a a variety of looks to the prints in the gallery. These two, for instance, um, this is called the contrast, and I put it up to show you the contrast in quality between the prints. At top left is a very fine late 1780s aqua tint, La Place Victoire à Paris, which is based on, on his travels in Paris. Um, very finely coloured in, uh, it's quite big, it's about this big. And then on the right we have the contrast, which is much smaller, it's only about um, six inches across. Very cheap, very cheaply produced, 
very hastily produced because it's commenting on a particular moment in time and a particular political situation. Notice also that one is far more subtly coloured than the other. Rowlandson begins to, begins to make his name as a satirist in 1784 with the Westminster election, which I'll talk a bit more about later on. Um, he lives in a golden age of satire, a time when there are some wonderful characters in the world of politics. You've got people like George IV, who is just funny by his very nature. Uh, you've got poor George III going mad. You've got Napoleon, who is so terrifying that all you can do is laugh at him. And characters like this, this is George IV's younger brother, the Duke of York, having a conversation with a whale. This is the whale which was caught off Gravesend. It was brought to London for all to admire. And it was sitting by London Bridge for about three days. And uh, as it sat there, it began to decompose and exude powerful odours. And it grabbed the attention of the media, much to the relief of the Duke of York, who is in a very difficult place. Uh, a scandal has just emerged in his private life. Well, his, his private life is getting uh, too tangled up in his public life. And uh, so he is begging the whale to take over the, the news so that people, so that it will take the heat off him a bit. And I just love the expression of the whale. It looks so gormless. Um, it is actually dead, but um, it's, it's looking very puzzled by the whole situation. So during this particular scandal, Rowlandson made 27 prints in just 44 days, almost one each day, commenting on the scandal as it unfolded. So he was very, very busy. He worked very closely with the media to get those jokes out there. He was also a noted topographer. As I said, he traveled to Paris as a student, but then he went back several times. He produced what we've already looked at, La Place Victoire, in 1783 as a drawing and then it was turned into this beautiful aquatint in 1789 but with Rowlandson you don't just get a picture of a place the people are always far more important and here um, I'll let you look closely at this upstairs because there's so much going on but one of the things in his his work that's always such a delight is the doggies he really loves his doggies look at these the little, little skinny one and big fat one having a conversation. And this mad French poodle with a wig on, <laughs> dancing a jig. Um, and then, of course, the ladies, the, the beautiful young ones and the big fat ones and the little skinny ones. Um, every character here is a delight. So there's always a very strong narrative element some of you might remember this gorgeous picture which we exhibited a long time ago, 2007. Do you remember in the Pleasure Gardens exhibition? Um, <clears throat> so this is a watercolour, not yet been turned into a print. What's called a tinted drawing. So a drawing made in pen and ink and then tinted, usually quite subtly, with watercolours. Vauxhall Gardens, not just a view of Vauxhall Gardens, but all the celebrities are here. So there are lots of famous characters we can pick out. There's the Duchess of Devonshire. Dr. Johnson is in there somewhere. I think he's in this fuzzy corner over here. <coughs> so he travels a lot, makes several tours of England and of Wales. He travels with his mates. He's a very, very sociable person. He goes um, on several adventures with this uh, man called Henry Wigstead, who um, is an important patron of him. And as he travels, he creates portfolios of drawings, which he then works up when he gets home. And some of them he turns into prints and illustrations. Some of the drawings he simply sells as drawings. 
So this is quite a nice example. This is the result of a trip to the Low Countries in 1791-2. to Dutch merchants sketched at Amsterdam a little snapshot of the different sort of people that you would find when you travelled. He travelled to Holland with another friend, Matthew Mitchell, who was a banker, and he had several country houses, so he would invite Rowlandson to stay with him and draw what he saw while he was there. Financially, Rowlandson lives on a bit of a roller coaster. Um, he worked very, very hard. He gave the market what it wanted, but he also spent money. Um, somebody said that he had an uncontrollable passion for gaming. In other words, like many of his contemporaries, he was probably addicted to gambling. Um, he drank a lot. He just enjoyed life. And this is uh, it's not particularly a self-portrait, but it's a glimpse into the life of the artist, of the indigent artist in his garret here with this hopeless wife who's still snoring in bed while these two poor little children try and look after themselves. There's a thirsty baby pouring itself a glass of gin. Another baby trying to keep warm. And look, even Doggy is desperate, so hungry, and begging the artist for some food. Um, he is completely focused on his work. He's even kicked over this chamber pot here. So that's, I think, is a bit of a joke of Rowlandson's against himself. Um, he was in and out of lodgings. He, he started off very prosperous because he lived with his Aunt Jane in Soho. When she died, she left him a lot of money. And he moved in with Betsy and stayed with Betsy for the rest of his life, but in increasingly squalid lodgings. Um, <clears throat> he did have a good art collection, he did have some very good patrons, so um, he moved around a lot and um, uh, like many people at the time, their fortunes fluctuated a lot. Towards the end of his life, he turned more and more to producing quality illustrated books. Illustrations like this this is a collaboration with two very interesting immigrants. One is Rudolf Ackerman, who was the publisher who compiled these books of beautiful colored illustrations. Um, he produced fashion magazines. He produced um, these wonderful images of everyday life at the turn of the 19th century. And um, so this one is Christie's auction room. We've chosen the Christie's image because it shows you a bit about how the art world worked. And it also shows you that um, Christie's were so impressed with the Farrow and Ball colours that we chose for our gallery that they thought they'd copy us. Um, the Microcosm is a very famous book. I'm sure that you will have seen images from this reproduced because they give us such a graphic picture of life in late Georgian London. And it looks not just at the famous tourist sites, it looks also at the darker side of life. It looks at Bridewell, it looks at an asylum for poor women. So it gives us a very clear idea of what life was like. The second man who collaborated with Rowlandson and Ackerman on this was a man called Auguste Pugin, the father of the more famous Augustus Welby Northmore Pugin, and I can't think of two more different people, Rowlandson and Pugin. That combination of names has, it's, it's just greats with me. They're such different, different people. But this Pugin was the father of Augustus Pugin, the architect. He was an architect as well, but mainly a draftsman. So he would have done all the architecture, and then Rowlandson added the figures. The end of Rowlandson's life, um, this is a portrait made by J.T. Smith, who was keeper of prints and drawings at the British Museum. As you can see, age 70, he's still busy, 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 scribbling away. He's got spectacles on, 
He's lost a lot of hair. He doesn't look anything like as handsome as he did earlier in life. Um, he continued to travel. He was very fortunate because he was able to go back to France after the war. Um, in, in 1814, he went back to Paris and he was able to admire all those beautiful things which Napoleon had stolen from Italy, from Spain, from Egypt, and brought to Paris. So that was a, a very important experience for Rowlandson. He made quite a lot of drawings while he was there. And he dies in 1827. But after his death, he went out of fashion. And he wasn't really fully rediscovered until the early 20th century, when there was a craze for all things Regency. Rowlandson was rediscovered. And one of the, or his, his first biographer, coincidentally, was Bernard Falk, the journalist who put together the Falk collection of portrait miniatures, most of which we have upstairs. So what we want to do in this exhibition is to show that Rowlandson was much more than just a commercial artist. He was a very clever businessman, um, but he was also a very talented, very sensitive draftsman. He had a genius for observing likenesses, for observing manners, and all the details of everyday life. So what we'll do now is I'm going to give you a quick virtual tour of the exhibition just to give you a sense of the layout and the themes in the exhibition. So as ever, we start at the entrance and then we turn left. So do encourage people when they go in to turn left um, and follow the story round um, anti... no clockwise. So this would be the wall directly in front of you as you enter. The walls in this room are exactly in the same position as they were for the Julian Opie exhibition. The gallery looks totally different, but we haven't moved anything. Um, ignore the garish colours on here. The colours on the walls are nothing like this, but this was just um, the layout that we do on our computer software to help us work out what goes where. So we start with an introduction to Rowlandson as an artist with the, uh, the two very early drawings, the Mortimer concert, um, and then two sort of keynote items. High spirits, this is what the exhibition's name has been taken from. This is a sort of very punning drawing. Spirits as in um, the, the, the mood of the lady, she's in cheerful spirits, but she's drinking spirits as well. And it shows us what a spirited artist, what a spirited character Rowlandson was. Somebody who could capture a whole character just with a few scribbles of ink. And our other keynote characters, Dr. Convex and Lady Concave. <laughs> this was collected by George III, and it's funny because he's really fat and she's really thin. And it's so simple. What I particularly love about this is those beautiful, beautiful colours. When you go upstairs, have a look at this purple on his belly, because this is an exquisite shade, I think. Um, and, and you'll see how, the, how there's a mixture of pigments that goes into it. It's very, very beautifully done. The inscription at the bottom I think sums up the whole exhibition. Man is the only creature endowed with the power of laughter. Is he not also the only one that deserves to be laughed at? So, Rowlandson wants, wants us to laugh at people, but also to allow ourselves to be laughed at, to see the ridiculousness in our own selves. The next wall, so this is on your left as you arrive. What we've tried to do here is to recreate that print shop window in the Gilray print to give a sense of the variety of what was on offer from Rowlandson. Very simple things like, you know, fat people and um, greedy people um, to complex political satires like the Covent Garden nightmare here. This is a, a political one. John Bull 
having his pockets picked by the new property tax. And he's saying, keep your hands from my pocket if you please. I think this is something that many of us will sympathise with, that horrible blue devil, cursed ugly devil, he calls him, who's trying to get whatever he can. This is just funny because fashion, at any time, fashion is ridiculous. And I just wish that Rowlandson were around today because if so many people could only see themselves, they would look as, as daft as this lady here. So funny faces, they're his sort of stock in trade, comical situations. But he does also look at some serious things. Um, you could look at this seriously and think this is about obesity, there are pictures about alcoholism, there are pictures, as we've seen, about fiscal problems, um, political corruption, um, celebrity scandals, all of the things that we're so familiar with from the media today. As you come round that corner, we come to a section about the Westminster election, this is where Rowlandson really makes his name as a satirist. It's a general election. It's very um, tough election between the two parties of the, of the time, the Whigs and the Tories. It's a, a wonderful occasion for satirists because there are such good characters. Here we have the two main protagonists of the election. William Pitt, the younger alias Billy Lackbeard, because he's so young, and he's, he's quite sort of blonde as well. You'll always recognise him because he's very tall and skinny, rather a priggish sort of character, an intellectual. He was a sort of maths genius. So he, wasn't, he was a great orator, but socially he wasn't um, a great speaker. He relied on alcohol a lot, as did his rival, Charles James Fox. Um, he enjoys his booze, he enjoys gambling, there's a, a dice set there, he enjoys his food as you can see and he is very very dark, he's got these great black eyebrows which he inherited from Charles II, so he's Charlie Blackbeard, he's the one on what we would nowadays call the left, he's the Whig party, um, he is the man of the people, he's very very popular with some, others are alarmed that he's too liberal, so these two great characters who are at the centre of, of politics throughout what we might call the Regency period. The Westminster election also has two very funny female protagonists. We have the very beautiful, very elegant Duchess of Devonshire, who got herself into trouble by canvassing on behalf of Fox and the Whig Party. So, Here's a friend of hers saying, huzzah, fox forever. And it was said that she exchanged kisses for votes. Um, that was just a, a nasty rumour. But there you see the most approved method of securing votes, kissing butchers. The other character, the wonderfully named Albinia, Countess of Buckinghamshire, alias Madame Blubber. And Madame Blubber was very, very fat, so she was automatically very hilarious. And here she has created great, uh, a great sensation. You see her above St. Paul's Covent Garden. Great sensation of turning herself into a hot air balloon. Her skirts have become a hot air balloon by the effusion of her own hot gases. And she floats off into the sky, and as she sails away, she sings this little ditty, which is written out here, two verses worth. Um, you can have a look at that later on and sing it to yourselves. Rather more serious was the sudden illness of George III. And what's interesting about this section is that Rowlandson makes cartoons for whoever will pay him. So as you've seen uh, in the Westminster election, he makes cartoons, uh, he, he satirises the Duchess of Devonshire on the Whig side and the Countess of Buckinghamshire on the Tory side. And here, this is one that he made um, against the Prince of Wales. This is a very, uh, very shocking picture. Um, I won't go into the details now because it's in the film, which we'll see later on. 
but there is the, the Prince of Wales, and there is the sick king in bed. And the Prince of Wales wants to see if he's dead yet, so he's hoping to get into power. This one was actually paid for by the Prince of Wales. He paid Rowlandson and his colleagues to make a series of prints which they then distribute around the country in mail coaches. And he is warning everybody, saying, this is what will happen if you're not careful. William Pitt will take over the country. He's carrying a piece of paper which says, I think myself as much entitled to be regent as the Prince of Wales. And he is leading Queen Charlotte, and she is stamping on the Prince of Wales's feathers. So Queen Charlotte, to some, was a very dangerous character. And then again, the moneylenders, as we've seen, the Prince of Wales having a good laugh at his own expense. Now, as I've said before, we've also sneaked in some extra material which relates to Bath. Um, so it's not in the catalogue, but we thought we had to include the comforts of Bath. So we've got all 12 of those. They're quite small. They're only about this big. And um, they were made in... Um, the 1790s. They're aquatints, so they're more expensive than etchings, and it's quite unusual to see a version that hasn't been coloured, so we thought it would be quite nice to include something that um, isn't on display elsewhere in Bath. To show you how, how these developed, um, this was an idea, this idea of um, people in Bath and all the silly things they get up to. Uh, it was an idea that Rowlandson had had in his head for quite some time and that he'd been sort of doing sketches around and, and thinking about. So this is a, an early version of the character being examined by physicians. And then that turns into this, uh, same sort of idea but set in an interior. And then finally, the Comforts of Bath printed version, which looks like this. I won't say any, any more about that, um, because I'm going to do a talk about it in December, um, but it's not in the catalogue, so if, if there is anything in particular about the Comforts of Bath, do ask me. Okay, this is the back wall, and uh, this is where we've put all those landscape drawings. The biggest and most important of which is the English Review. This is really important because it was Rowlandson's first exhibition piece. It was exhibited as a work of art at the Royal Academy. It's um, a drawing, a tinted drawing, and um, it's not, not really a landscape as such, but it's showing um, British soldiers exercising with an audience watching them. And of course, the audience are getting up to all sorts. Um, there's a clergyman up there with a telescope watching what's going on. There's somebody else in the carriage here, conveniently positioned to look up this lady's skirt. There are dogs, of course. There are always dogs. Um, and horses, all beautifully drawn. This was purchased by the Prince of Wales. He saw it in the Academy exhibition. He was very impressed, and he purchased this, and it's been in that collection ever since. There are about 10,000 surviving drawings by Rowlandson, so that shows you how very prolific he was. This is one that I found particularly fascinating, Rag Fair. The Rag Fair was um, a, a place near Liverpool Street um, where... Um, second-hand clothes were bought and sold. Most people at this time did not own any brand new clothes. Their clothes were, were handed down, were passed on from those who could afford to have new clothes. So it's a very important market. And this is the beginning of the East End rag trade of the 19th and 20th centuries. And most of it is run by immigrants, just as nowadays um, it's been taken over now by people from the Indian subcontinent, but at the time it was all being run by Jews like Widow Levy here, um, again not one for the politically correct, but what I love is that they're all wearing all their hats, all the, all the stock of hats is, is 
being worn on the heads of various of these characters. Here's another fat lady with some shoes set out for sale. Um, and keep looking because I'm sure, yeah, there he is, there's the dog. There's always a dog. This bit is, so now we've got our backs to the back wall, we're facing back towards the door, and this is the back of that first wall. Scenes of everyday life, these are just pictures of the aren't people funny sort. There are a few rude ones in there as well, so be warned. This is uh, a couple of antiques, some very typical Rowlandson characters. You get three dogs in that one. And this amazing picture, Rachel Pringle of Barbados. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. It's not particularly meant to be funny. It's just a picture of a famous person. Rachel Pringle was a freed woman. Her father was Scottish. Her mother was an African slave. And she ran a hotel, the main hotel in Bridgetown in Barbados. So any sailor or anyone who traveled there would have come across this character. She was very well known in Britain. And you can tell from the amount of bling that she's wearing that she was a very, very successful businesswoman. So she's quite a character, and it's a fascinating picture of a, perhaps a side of 18th century life that we don't think that much about. We are now in the corner, sort of against the back wall. There's a very small section here on the Napoleonic Wars. Um, in this section, there are only four prints. We've really had to cut this one down. Um, but they're interesting because they're of, of quite different qualities. So the top two are expensive, they're aquatints. There's this grotty, cheapo one at the bottom. Um, <clears throat> Threepence this cost. Threepence plain, sixpence coloured. So it's just about as cheap as you can get. Um, this is a nice aquatint. This is also an aquatint, but it's rather discoloured because it's so important. This is the glorious victory. It's the Battle of the Nile, 1st of August, 1798. This is a poster for people to put on their walls to celebrate the victory. So it's been framed, it's been hung and it's a little bit the worse for wear. And then we have another cheap one. Um, this one is interesting from a commercial point of view because this is one of many where the design was done by Henry Woodward and the engraving was done by Rowlandson. So it looks a little bit different from your typical Rowlandson style. This is uh, coming up to the exit now. This is the, the section about the Duke of York. I've spoken a little bit about that already. This was the scandal that broke in 1809 because unbeknown to him, Mrs. Clark, his mistress, Mary Ann Clark, uh, she added to the end of his list of promotions. He, he was the commander in chief of the British Army, and he had a list of people to promote, and she added a few extra names on in exchange for money. And their letters were published. This was highly embarrassing. The letters between the Duke and Mrs. Clark were published, and they say things like, my dear little angel. But these have been published in code because um, the author, Thomas Rowlandson, of the, this, he, he, doesn't want, he doesn't want to offend anybody. It's, it's, uh, so it's a sort of pretend censorship, putting them into code. And you'll have great fun trying to decipher it all. The Duke has to resign. Um, John Bull is overwhelmed with grief. He's begging him not to go. He's saying, you be such a desperate moral character. He doesn't want him to leave. And in fact, his, his resignation was very short-lived. He was back in his job within a few months. The last wall um, is about the theatre. Rowlandson was very closely attached to the theatre. Um, he had lots of friends in the theatre. One of his favourite drinking buddies was John Bannister, and John Bannister's name will, of course, be very familiar to you because we've got two portraits of him in the Somerset Maugham 
collection. They're both up at the top at the moment, but you'll, you'll recognise his name, I'm sure. This is the last one in that group, Chaos is Come Again. So it's the last picture in the exhibition, an apocalyptic vision of a theatre collapsing and imploding in on itself. I should just mention the book. I showed you the illustration of Christie's showroom. This is the gorgeous binding which was made for the Prince of Wales. It's got his arms on it. It feels lovely, but you're not allowed to feel it. I've been very lucky. And the screen. The screen is extraordinary. It was probably professionally made, we think, by Samuel Fors, who was one of Rowlandson's publishers. Not everything on the screen is by Rowlandson. Not everything is British. Not everything is funny. But what is funny is the way that things have been juxtaposed. So there are characters cut out of different prints who are sort of talking to each other and interacting with each other. We're not sure how this came into the royal collection. It seems to have been purchased in the time of Edward VII. And it was discovered by the curator of this exhibition, Kate Hurd. She discovered it at Sandringham. It's been repaired. You can read all about the conservation on the Royal Collection website. But do enjoy it. Do have a very good look at it because there are all sorts of extraordinary things going on here. <clears throat> I'll just jump past that for now because I want to mention a few practical things. Um, this is one of the activities in the Sackler, so if you get any families, do encourage them to go in. Um, I, this is an exhibition that I hope children will really enjoy. There are some sort of semi-obscene things in the exhibition, but I don't think there's anything that would be unsuitable for children because it's all innuendo. So you may see things, but children hopefully won't. Um, there's a catalogue, of course, I'm sure you've already seen it in the shop. Um, I know that people will ask about the farrow and ball colours. So that's our main colour, that's called dead salmon. That is cardroom green. They've both got very um, appropriate names, I think. And then we've got London clay again. This was one of the colours that we used for Joseph Wright. <clears throat> but we'll put up little cards with those names on them. So there we are. Um, I know that Spencer is waiting for you upstairs, but before you go, would you like to see the cartoon? Let's have a look at the cartoon then. I'm going to stop this. <clears throat> 